welcome to the CIB Intelligence Report, the show that brings you the latest developments in the Chanticleer Intelligence Brief. The CIB is Coastal's pre-professional applied analysis group that is supported by the Department of Politics at Coastal Carolina University. I am Tyra Bjorlo, the CIB's recruitment officer, and we are coming to you today from the Edwards College of Humanities and Fine Arts here at CCU. In earlier shows, we featured interviews with some of the important student figures in the CIB's history with experts on topics such as North Korea's nuclear program, the Islamist militancy in Nigeria, as well as the status of Mexico's drug cartels. We have with us today Derek Storizeri and Ryan Lawrence. Derek serves as the CIB's finance officer and head of the North America's desk. He is a sophomore intelligence and national security studies major from Bluffton, South Carolina. This semester, he is also serving as an analyst and is looking at the current and projected state of U.S.-Mexican relations. Ryan, a senior intelligence and national security studies major from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, serves as an analyst this semester as well. Throughout the course of this semester, Ryan will be determining which drug cartel is the most powerful in Mexico. Both analysts are here to speak about their topics today. Hi guys, welcome to the show. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Good, good. How are you all? Good. So Derek, can we start off with a brief summary of the current relations between U.S. and Mexico? Sure. Um, I'll take you back to the elections. Uh, last year in July, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was elected the new president of Mexico. Um, he's the successor to Enrique Pino Nieta, um, and he was sworn into office in November. Um, since that time, there's been no meeting or anything between the presidents, and there's a bit of a... We're trying to establish our relationship with Mexico um, following the election. Um, in the past, the United States and Mexico have had, you know, joint operations with each other. We're, you know, we're trade partners. Um, they're our third biggest exporting partner in, out of the entire world. Um, and in the 1980s, for example, we had a joint uh, drug operation where we would uh, go after Mexican drug cartels. And this was actually this stopped in the 1980s after uh, one of the DEA agents was killed in Mexico. And there was a little bit of a rocky, rocky start there, but eventually. Um, it just led to relations being established, and now we're just trying to see what's going to happen in the future. So you mentioned to me that we have not yet seen a meeting between President Donald Trump mm -hmm. and Mexican President, President AMLO. Do you foresee a meeting like pretty soon between the two? I'd say within the next couple of months. Um, that's my best guess. Um, of course, with every president, um, Every newly elected president is going to have to have a meeting with another president, especially with a big trade partner or someone right on our border, such as Mexico, and with the hot topics like the immigration and the border wall and all of these things, I think the best thing to happen would be for a meeting to take place between the two presidents just to see where we stand. Hmm. That would be interesting. Um, Ryan, I want to get to you about the beginning of prominent drug cartels. When did we see them come onto the scene? And later we'll discuss a little bit more of their impact on U.S.-Mexico relations as well. Of course, you know, you can, of course this semester I'm working on specifically Mexican drug cartels, but I think before we talk about how they got their start, it's necessary to go back and look at the Colombian cartels that really got the whole process started. You can, the most notorious and well-known and probably the first well-organized one was the Medellin cartel, um, of course, ran by the infamous Pablo Escobar. They really pioneered uh, cocaine trafficking, and the Reagan operations in the 80s really shut down their methods of trafficking that involved uh, package drops um, off the coast of Florida uh, and then bringing it into the United States, at which point they turned to a liaison with Mexican smugglers. And this is really where you start to see the beginnings, and, and this is during the 1980s, the beginnings of what would eventually become the Mexican drug cartels. Um, the DEA referred to this initial group as the Guadalajara cartel, um, very prominent throughout the 80s, at least the beginning of the 80s, until the Mexican military conducted a raid on a marijuana farm belonging to the Guadalajara cartel and burned millions of dollars worth of marijuana, which frustrated uh, the leaders of the cartel, so I they, so. <laughs> yeah, naturally, so they kidnapped uh, a DEA agent, as Rick mentioned, uh, Enrique Kiki Camarina, in broad daylight, as well as his pilot. He was tortured and brutally murdered, which spurred U.S. motivations to go into Mexico and do something about the problem. They arrested key figures within the Guadalajara cartel, 
And eventually in the late 80s, what remained of the leadership in the Guadalajara cartel uh, called a summit of the country's most prominent smugglers and drug traffickers and divided up their territory into what was called plazas or territories that would be controlled by different cartels. And this is where you really start to see competition and shifting alliances between different cartels. So just to follow up on that matter a little bit, the drug cartels, we know they're very territorial. Um, it's one way we actually, and you have told me several times, they measure their powers based on territory. So what effects do or can drug cartels have on state relations? So in this case, we are specifically talking about U.S.-Mexican relations. But in terms of um, a drive and want for power, can that like, bleed over into other borders, specifically between the U.S. and Mexico and the border that we're now seeing as a major conflict? Yeah, of course, I think one of the best known border cities along the southwest border is Ciudad Juarez, one of the best <coughs> known ones, um, known for its violence and its high murder rate. Um, but the truth is, is very often violence does not spill over into the United States. Uh, we do see uh, certain conflicts every once in a while along the southwest border, but that's typically designated as trafficker on trafficker violence. Uh, the fact of the matter is the cartels know that if they allow their violent methods to bleed over into the United States, that they would probably face a lot harder persecution from the United States authorities. So they they're have, more fearful of opposing states, more or less? They, yeah, they have a little more operational immunity in Mexico because of their corrupted officials and their protect, uh, protection networks that they create. Hmm. So... One of the things that um, we talked about in regards to not only U.S.-Mexico relations, but the effect that it has on drug cartels as well, and that was the cooperation of the El Chapo extradition and trial. We saw him escape several times from prisons in Mexico, pay off government officials. He now was tried and convicted in the United States with the exception that he would not be um, sentenced to death. That was one of Mexico's clauses. Can you speak a little bit more of how that could be a positive, you and Rick as well, a positive with um, drug cartels and U.S.-Mexican relations? Now, countering drug cartels, not necessarily a positive for them because obviously the Sinaloa lost their leader, but could you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, I think that it, it's a positive sign in terms of cooperation between the United States and Mexico. Um, Previously, Guzman is famous, or El Chapo is famous for his two previous escapes from Mexican maximum security prisons, one in a laundry cart and the second from a mile-long tunnel in which he dropped through the floor of his shower and used a specialized dirt bike to escape to a nearby construction site. So he is very well known for his escapes, and of course those incidents were very embarrassing for the Mexican government. So while they were initially determined to handle it themselves, they realized that by trying to do it themselves a third time and facing a souring relationship with the United States that they would greatly benefit from extraditing him and allowing the United States to um, prosecute him in their country. Hmm. But Can you speak to us a little bit more on state relations in regard? We heard from the drug cartels that it's a positive as far as countering that. And now can we speak to how Mexico has responded to El Chapo's um, sentencing? Uh, yeah. yeah, sentencing. <laughs> um, I can talk a little bit about the whole situation uh, with the United States um, actually incarcerating him and sentencing him in New York City. Um, I think it shows a sign of good faith between the United States and Mexico, you know, from my personal opinion. Um, you know, talking back to that joint operation in the 1980s under the Reagan administration, um, that's something that, you know, sadly with the, the assassination of Kiki Camarena, um, it just led to the two countries just splitting off and having a little bit of a sour, you know, taste in their mouth. Right. But with maybe this cooperation could show that the United States is willing to uh, cooperate with Mexico on joint uh, drug operations, especially after the um, the state of emergency declaration by Pres U.S. President Donald Trump. Um, now the Depart the U.S. Department of uh, Defense has 2.7 billion dollars worth of funding they now get to allocate, and I'm sure that a lot of that money is going to go towards drug operations and Mexico. Of course, with the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA, you know, coming into the fray, 
Um, it would probably be smart for Mexico to start to cooperate with the United States in operations like this just to help relations altogether. Because if they want the trade deal to go through, they're definitely going to want to have some operation. But I think this could be the first step in better improving relationships between the countries is just uh, joint drug operations following uh, Joaquin Guzman, otherwise known as El Chapo's um, sentencing. Okay. Uh. So you spoke about specifically El Chapo mm -hmm. and his effect that you see on U.S.-Mexican relations. Can you give us a broader picture of the effects that drug cartels have on U.S.-Mexican relations today and possibly give us a little insight into the future? Mm -hmm. Um, with Im the United States and Mexico are both facing an immigration crisis. That's you know that's something we all should know. Um, but one of the driving forces behind this is fear of the drug cartels. I mean they're ruthless. From you know from news sources you can see that they they kill, they you know steal, rape, all these horrible things to people. And these Mexican citizens are actually scared for their lives, and that's why they try to go to a different country. Um, one of the things that got AMLO, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, the president of Mexico, elected mm -hmm. was that he's very into reformation of Mexico, and he's very progressive for a Mexican president. They haven't seen that in a long time. And what he wants to do is make, Amer like, make um, Mexico enticing to be in. Not, they don't want, he doesn't want his citizens to go to America and emigrate there. He wants them to stay and build up Mexico and make it a more mm -hmm. of a prosper like, prosperous country. Um, right. You know, that's one of the reasons that so many people are immigrating is because of the drug cartels. And I think if they nullified the effect of the drug cartels, mm -hmm. you'd definitely see a rise in population in Mexico, a decrease in immigration. And then, again, like I said with a talk in the future, that could probably help negotiate what to do with the border wall situation. Mm -hmm. So if people aren't really immigrating anymore, then there's no reason to have a border wall. But if they are, then they can still discuss it. Right. Um, just two, two testimonies that I heard as far as the just ruthlessness of the drug cartels and uh. the amount of control they actually have, which Ryan could probably speak to in their home countries, is that we see they control nearly every aspect. Just personally speaking to two undocumented immigrants that are here and have been here for a long time working to achieve <clears throat> the American dream, they both were chased out by drug cartels. One, you know, as a police officer in Mexico, he was approached by somebody from the drug cartel and said, look, if you don't join or if you don't um, work for us, more or less, and corrupt the state of the policing in Mexico, then, you know, we're going to come after you and your family. And he was luckily able to escape from the country before being targeted. Um, another case of a younger um, Hispanic male who was approached by a drug cartel, and that's one of their big targets as far as young and drawing them into the drug cartels, controlling a lot of territory, and he refused the offer unknowingly to the drug cartel until he escaped the next day into Mexico. So we, I think just from those two personal stories, we see how serious this issue really is as far as the immigration in, in terms of the U.S.-Mexico relations, and, as, and two, how much... Um, impact the drug cartels have on not only the state of Mexico, but um, in neighboring countries as well. So just going off of that point, um, Rick, what actions do you think could be taken by Mexico to minimize the impact of drug cartels? I think one of the things uh, definitely that would aid in this would be immigration reform. Um, it's such a hot topic now, and everyone's talking about immigration reform. But as cliche as it sounds, it's something that really needs to be addressed in order to stop this. Um, if they, you know, if there's a joint drug cooperation, like similar to the 1980s, as we both mentioned before, um, minimizing the impact of the drug cartels, I think immigration reform would be the next step, and that itself would definitely help the situation. If the drug cartels can't impacts a lot of people um, due to being either incarcerated or completely disbanded by the operations of the United States and Mexican governments jointly, then I think that the immigration situation is going to start to, you know, catalyze and be fixed way faster. Um, I think that they would improve the state of Mexico, all of the government's stability, and reduce the corruption because if these drug cartels have a lot of influence, um, and there is a lot of co corruption in various South American countries, but if you eliminate that from the situation, then I just believe that the corruption is going to stop and everything is going to start to go into motion and everything will start working again um, in a more reformed way. So speaking off of the point of corruption, um, we'll go back to Ryan here. And we all know you've been heavily following the El Chapo case, and we did hear that there was, was it a $100 million payoff to the president or a government official? Uh, it was a 
this was it was said in a testimony. Um, of course, it, it was a supposed one hundred million dollar bribe paid to then President Enrique Peña Nieto. Uh, Nieto and or his attorneys have of course denied this claim, mm -hmm. so it is only rumored at this point in time. But if that is true, uh, we can definitely see how significant the corruption in Mexico is and how it permeates every level of Mexican government. Right. Can you give us, um, that was, you know, a prominent example that most of the public, whether it's Mexican public or the U.S. public has seen as far as a cut and dry example of the influence that these drug cartels have and they carry in Mexico. Can you speak to us a little bit more about in terms of, I think there's a lot of lack of understanding about what the Mexican citizens actually face as a result of the drug cartels being in Mexico so heavily uh, widespread as they are. Can you speak to a little bit more to maybe like their, you know, their tactics, like how they um, are so threatening, the things they do, um, even you said uh, competitions between cartels can also you know, catch Mexican citizens in the middle or just violence in general. Can you speak to us a little bit more about those points and the brutality and what we see coming from the drug cartels to have so much influence? Yeah, I mean, it really, brutality is a, is a great word for it. Uh, they're in, they have military grade weaponry that they use indiscriminately. And a lot of the times the cartel on cartel violence is what catches innocent people in the crosshairs. They can pull up to a nightclub or a bar and just open fire. Um, so I think a lot of it is the fear that they strike in the citizens there. And to some extent, they even have police officers that will kidnap people and drop them off to cartel personnel. Wow. So it really is a matter of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, it's impossible to run a small business without paying the cartel that controls the territory you operate that business on. Right. They control almost every aspect of daily life in certain areas for Mexican citizens. So that fear and that inability to do anything without the cartel's knowledge or prior approval is really what you can see how deeply that would affect citizens' lives and also how that feeds into the immigration issue as well. Now, just speaking off that one point um, where you mentioned small business owners having to pay cartels. You know, they, they run their, you know, the head honchos, they run those businesses as far as the economic aspect of it and um, really get a good portion that those businesses are supposed to be um, taking in for themselves. And um, one of the cases I mentioned previously about um, a guy, his brother and sister actually run a business and he said that the amount that they owe is insane a month. They owe sometimes a little over a thousand dollars a month to these drug cartels to continue operating the businesses in Mexico which a thousand dollars is a lot different in Mexico than it is here um, we know that there's skyrocketing poverty rates in some areas and then they also have your tourist attractions which bring in a lot of the money um, and now we see a threat for the American tourists who are trying to travel to Mexico and therefore the cartels are really really increasing their influence because it's preventing a lot of the tourists and the money from coming into the country so they feel like they have to wrap up and really um, take a stance and be more harsh on uh, seems like small businesses so that's that's a really interesting comment as well the border wall as we know remains a hot topic and Ryan I just wanted to know in your opinion um, do you think the border wall will have a positive impact on countering drugs in the cartels I think, I think the first thing you have to keep in mind is that at the moment the most common method of drug trafficking is through legal entry points along the border. Uh, the cartels utilize hidden compartments in vehicles. They also disguise them within legitimate cargo. Uh, one thing that came out of the El Chapo trial was a case where they packed jalapeno cans full of <laughs> cocaine and hid them among the real cans. Um, mm -hmm. The ones that had cocaine in them were also filled with sand so that they would have the proper weight. Uh, and this is really a sophisticated smuggling operation. And it's not just the entry points along the border. It is also, they will use submersible crafts um, along the coasts. 
They will use drones to drop lightweight packages over the border for clandestine pickups. They do still utilize mule, like mules and right. drug carrying personnel to uh, go along remote trails along the border. But I think if there is to be a physical barrier that technology needs to exist to counter all of the capabilities and the ingenuity that the cartels are able to utilize, um, such as tunnels being built underneath the border, something that El Chapo is famous for, not only for escapes, but also for the drug smuggling. That's how he became so well known, is the speed at which he could get drugs across the border. And a big reason for that is his use of tunnels along the border. So if there is to be a physical wall along the border, then we have to utilize technology that we have to effectively counter the different smuggling possibilities, mm -hmm. not just put something there to stop a person from physically crossing it. I think that would be a better first step to counter some of these issues that drug trafficking brings into the United States. Mm. It seems like we see a lot um, who a lot of arguments surrounding not just having a physical bar barrier but complementing it with technology as well. That's really interesting um, as far as the capabilities go from uh, for the drug cartels. We have to be able to counter their capabilities too, not just you know physically walking across the border and having a wall there. Like you said, using technology to complement that. So based on what we heard from Ryan now, Rick, I would like to know how you see the border wall in the case, in the event that we do have the wall sometime in the near future. How do you see that playing out with U.S. and Mexico? Do we have, um, do you think it would be more negative, more positive, and give us a little more de uh, detail about those? That's a really interesting topic because, again, I'm going to push that there has to be a meeting between these two countries before any of this takes place. Um, you know, in the past, the United States have, has done things without Mexican permission or approval, which, you know, hurts relations. But I think if something as important as the border wall, mm -hmm. for example, you're going to need to have the two leaders discuss it. Um, and AMLO, one of the things that he was elected for is immigration reform. So if he's in favor of it and Donald Trump decides that he wants to continue building the border wall uh, jointly, you know, with the cooperation of Mexico, whether or not they pay for it or whatever is decided during that meeting, I think it would be beneficial for the relations because both the, right. both the leaders agreed on it, and if it helps immigration reform for both countries, then it would be beneficial. But in the case that you know Trump doesn't speak to AMLO prior to this, or he talks to him and then AMLO says you know he voices his disapproval, and then Trump does it anyway, it's going to be perceived negatively by the Mexican government for sure. Right. Um, because if we're a country, you know we're we're a country that borders Mexico, and we should be cooperating. And if we actually have a physical border between the two countries, I think it just symbolizes a lack of a will to cooperate between the United States and Mexico, which is definitely going to impact um, relations for the negative. Very interesting yeah. point of views we have here. Two, two very similar but different in their own ways of addressing their topics in regards to the border wall. Um, all right, Ryan, we got to get to the ultimate question here. Of course. Right now, which is the most powerful drug cartel? And that's definitely a difficult question because as you know, you've, you've touched on territories is an important thing, but it also has to do with uh, capabilities, mm -hmm. um, leadership status, because they do rely on a cohesive leadership group. Uh, when leaders are removed, as we've seen during the Mexican drug war over the past decade, mm -hmm. when you do remove leaders, um, there is a vacuum that exists that then it creates competition for leadership, and that certainly spikes violence rates. Right. As individuals within the cartels split, they create warring factions, and they vie for greater power. Right. So I would have to say right now, still the Sinaloa cartel, as they've been around for such a long time, even with the conviction of El Chapo, I would say how that plays into it is it signals what is certainly an uncertain future for the Sinaloa cartel. Mm -hmm. The suspected current leader, uh, Ismael El Mayo Zambada, a uh, longtime associate of El Chapo, is currently the leader of the Sinaloa, but he is aging and rumored to be increasingly isolated. You also have the issue of Chapo's two sons mm -hmm. that are, in some cases, rumored to be 
prominent figures within the cartel and in others considered to be spoiled children who don't have a place in the leadership group. So, you know, we could start to see a deterioration of the Sinaloa over the coming years. Um, it is a slow going process though. Um, they do still possess the largest international footprint as right. well as the largest footprint in the United States. So that says something. But they do have challengers, especially in the uh, Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or as also known as the CJNG. Um, they are very aggressive. They've expanded their territory quickly, mm -hmm. and they are up and coming. So they do present a significant challenge to the dominance of the Sinaloa Cartel. So we have the classic intelligence uh, prediction here, very long and drawn out, no, no point <laughs> estimates here. But um, uh, Rick, I would like to um, lastly go to you and just ask, um, what is the most important policy or event that needs to happen to really ramp up U.S.-Mexico relations in a positive direction? If you could name one thing, probably the most important, nail it down now. Um, I'm going to say kind of a hybrid um, I think the most important things are a meeting about immigration reform needs to take place, mm -hmm. but I also think the ratification of the USMCA, the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, mm -hmm. also needs to take place, and those are the two things that are going to rev it up, um, rev up the relations between the United States and Mexico, and possibly Canada, but so that's not my topic. So we're seeing a positive outlook. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'm going to predict hopefully it'll be positive, um, but again, that's contingent on whether or not the United States and Mexico agree on anything. Um, right. There's a whole issue discussing labor reform in Mexico mm -hmm. before the next, um, because the USMCA has actually been signed and ratified um, by, you know, Justin Trudeau, Donald right. Trump, and then former President Enrique Peña Nieto. Um, that happened in November of last year, and mm -hmm. all of our, all the Congresses are just waiting on ratification now. Right. But there's a couple steps along the way that each country has to take, so, you know, there was the issue of, like, Tariffs uh, imposed on Mexico, that, that's a big issue, um, and they're not signing their labor reform bill until the tariffs are addressed. So things like that need to happen in order for the USMCA to be ratified and then for a meeting to happen between the, the two world leaders. Very interesting stuff we have here. Well, this brings us to the end of our program. I want to thank our guests, CIB analysts Derek Storzeri and Ryan Lawrence, for their timely and up-to-date insight on their topics of research. For more about the CIB, please visit our website, www.cibrief.org, CIB Brief, or our social media pages, which you can find on our website. This is Tyra Biorlo with the CIB Intelligence Report. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>